is the 26th Farnborough Air Show and the biggest yet. Over 40 years, Farnborough has laid claim to the title the world's greatest air show, a claim justified by the spectacle offered, the flying skills displayed, the planes on view and the business opportunity created. In 1984, 150 aircraft are on show and as they arrive at the start of Farnborough week, an intricate, complex organisation moves into top gear. Gentlemen, good morning and welcome to those who have only just arrived here at Farnborough. I'm Group Captain David Schooler and I'm Chairman of the Flying Control Committee. May I remind you of the aim of the show? It's to permit skillful and convincing demonstrations of your aircraft's capabilities, but flight safety and the safety of the public are of paramount importance. Don't fly over the spectators. Do not fly closer than the runway centre line. The minimum height at any time is 100 feet above the ground and in those circumstances you must be straight and level. There's a display line which is marked by Dayglow marker boards which extends through the line of the control tower and parallel to the main runway and it is 700 feet from the spectator safety fence. Good morning gentlemen. That is the situation for four o'clock this morning, and as you can see, we are yet again plagued with frontal systems. The, the pilots who fly at Farnborough are the best, professionals who must act as showmen of the air, displaying for their companies and countries not only their skills, but all the capabilities of the planes they fly. About 1,006 millibars. At the present time, we've got 1,008. At the first stroke, it will be 9, 57, and 10 seconds. Making sure that they can is the responsibility of Farnborough's organisers. Into the narrow skies above the airfield will be packed the performances of planes so varied and so versatile that the strictest controls are necessary. Radar is a vital ingredient. Farnborough's safety committee includes Brian Trubshaw, famous as Britain's chief Concorde test pilot. He and his colleagues try to ensure that by flying their aircraft to the limit, pilots do not endanger themselves or spectators. In 40 years, there have been four serious accidents here. There was one this year. Fortunately, no one was injured. Planes do crash at air shows, and it's to the credit of Farnborough's organisers that at this show, they happen so rarely. Farnborough is a Ministry of Defence establishment, and ultimate control in the flight tower rests with the Royal Air Force. Their task is made more complicated by the need to dovetail their programme with flights in and out of the world's busiest airport nearby Heathrow. Farnborough is a showplace, a competitive arena for products and companies, a shop window where sellers show and buyers look. 530 companies are here. Not too many deals will actually be concluded but much groundwork can be laid, leading to orders not only for planes, but for high-tech equipment and systems of all kinds. The names at Farnborough are the great names of the industry. Some are British, some American, some European. Nearly all are well known. Aerospatial is in the red for the first time in five years, but powerful and vital to Europe in a vast range of products, civil and military. Rolls-Royce has won a big order for RB211 engines from Saudi Arabia. Military production includes the Pegasus for the Harrier and the 199 for the Tornado. Although doing well financially, British Aerospace needs the next generation Eurofighter. Tornado production ends in 1989. The Airbus 
has made Aerospatiale one of the world's most important civil aircraft manufacturers. But sales are now down. Europe's chief rival in the field is Boeing, whose 737-300 is on show. American technology still dominates much of this industry. The AWACS symbolize a depth and breadth of capability based on a vast domestic market. Yet, this is an international industry, and for Europe, joint production arrangements are now a way of life. The Tornado is a prime example. Several nations have made it, therefore several nations have bought it. It would seem the only way to compete with America, and even the Americans look for partners nowadays. There are two versions of the Tornado, the Strike version and the Air Defence variant. Both flew at Farnborough, showing their formidable power. 16,000 pound thrust with reheat, its variable geometry, its awesome armory, all this on show. This is Europe's key all-weather combat aircraft for the 1980s, and here is its display. Since the Falklands War, the Harrier has entered legend. Over 40 C and RAF Harriers were deployed in the South Atlantic, proving their unique value in the toughest conditions. The US Marine Corps has ordered 328, and total orders exceed 700 aircraft. At this year's Farnborough, it was the Sea Harrier that showed its paces, up, down, forwards, backwards, and indeed sideways. The Delta profile of France's Mirage jets are almost as familiar a shape at Farnborough as the Harrier. This year, however, there is a difference. The Mirage 2000 is, in the judgment of its makers, Dassault Berger, 
Europe's combat aircraft of tomorrow, here today. This version, the 2000N, is a plane with nuclear capability, scheduled to be part of France's independent force de frappe. But independence is no longer the key word for Dassault Berger. They want participation, and if possible, leadership, in the international consortium to build Europe's next Eurofighter. Their claim to preeminence is the Mirage 2000. So at Farnborough, their pilots were flying for high stakes. combat aircraft, the Americans have the numbers. Over 700 F-15s have been delivered. Over 3,000 F-16s have been ordered. The twin-engined F-15 Eagle is built by McDonnell Douglas with Pratt & Whitney engines. Saudi Arabia, Israel and Japan have all bought the plane, and its performance shows it to be a formidable air superiority fighter. Sandra 82, this plane stole the show. The F-16's flying display was that year as dramatic as it was versatile. This year, it somewhat stood aside for America's latest star, the F-20. Nevertheless, its performance illustrated just why 10 nations have ordered more than a thousand of these fighting Falklands, in addition to the United States Air Force's planned procurement of over 2,000 planes. America's latest combat star is the F-20, the Tiger Shark. Made by Northrop, the F-20 has cost the company $575 million in research and development. They claim it to be a match for the F-16 and cheaper. To date, there are no sales, but Northrop is convinced that like the Mirage 2000, this is a fighter for tomorrow, taking off today.
question is, what will tomorrow really bring? Will Europe's big three, Britain, France and Germany, all combine for the first time to build one fighter? The ACX is France's vision of that plane. Dessault Berger would be the main contractor. It would fully exploit the familiar delta geometry and it would meet the key specifications already agreed by all the chiefs of staff. This is the German view of the same plane. The concept is that of Messerschmitt Belkau Blohm. Like the British aerospace model shown in 1982, this EFA also meets the requirements. It would be agile, single-seated, twin-engined, and able to take off and land in difficult conditions. And at this year's Farnborough, British Aerospace provided a glimpse of one revolutionary concept which might render obsolete both the Space Shuttle and its current competitor, the European Ariane. British Aerospace's vision is that of a horizontal takeoff space plane, flexible and quick. This strange anteater-like vehicle would not need an elaborate launch pad nor a laborious countdown procedure. Space is very big business and Europe doesn't intend to leave it all to the Americans. NASA dominates, but no monopoly is safe even in space. From the transport system of the year 2000, Farnborough seems to take a long leap backwards to the airship, the air transport concept of the 1900s. After half a century, the airship is back, not as nostalgia, but as one answer to high travel costs and the need for flexible ways of carrying goods and passengers. Non-flammable fuels have removed the terrible vulnerability of the old airships and vectored thrust engines plus advanced plastic technology make these thoroughly modern craft. But airship industries need orders. Two 500 versions have been sold in America and one in Japan. The 600 is larger and a far bigger version able to carry 200 passengers is now planned. Propeller developments on display at Farnborough also illustrate how new technology and new commercial pressures are leading to the revival of old aspects of aviation. The jet engine was meant to have relegated the propeller to the museum, except for small craft. Now the propeller is back in its advanced technology form. Many famous names are committed. British Aerospace, Doughty, Shorts, Dornier, General Electric. A profusion of planes and their propellers were on show at Farnborough 84 and more can be expected in 86. Short sky vans are one of the most successful propeller driven planes around today. The military cargo version has even been bought by the United States Air Force. The de Havilland Buffalo was unlucky at Farnborough. It proved that what goes up must come down, but in the event it did so a little too sharply. General Electric provided one of the most intriguing propeller designs, the counter-rotating unducted fan engine, 
which GE sees as a quiet, efficient pusher for short to medium range transports in the 1990s. The helicopter has always depended on the versatility of rotating blades and in 1984 Farnborough provided the show place for intense competition between manufacturers in a still somewhat depressed market. Westland has had to cut its workforce because of reduced demand for both military and civil helicopters. Despite the triumphs for their craft in the Falklands War, only one major military order has been received in the last year from the Indian Navy for Sea Kings. Nevertheless, the reputation won by British helicopters in the combat conditions of the South Atlantic will be important, especially as demand recovers. The sheer versatility of the helicopter guarantees its enduring place in the international aviation market. Certainly, the superpowers retain their faith in helicopters. In 1984, the Russians were at Farnborough for the first time, and the world's largest helicopter, the Mil-26, was their lead exhibit. Able to lift a massive 27 tons, its very existence has stimulated the United States to plan a Boeing giant that will lift up to 35 tons. Meanwhile, Aeroflot has a monopoly on size, if not on elegance. Russia's Antonov 72, a short takeoff transport, also proved strong on agility rather than beauty. Indeed, that manoeuvre proved so agile that it provoked a rebuke from Farnborough's safety committee. As the public address system commented, you don't see that too often. Russia's vast air transport network requires planes that can lift heavy loads easily and land on rough fields. The Antonov 72 is designed to do both. The Soviets also showed their first wide-bodied jet, the Aleutian 86, a jumbo for 350 passengers. The battle of the air buses was less evident at this year's Farnborough, but the tension is there in the marketplace. The A310 and A300 have sold well, with nearly 250 in service worldwide. But last year, only six were sold. And Airbus's rival Boeing is determined to capture the 150-seater market. Airbus would like to soar away from its competition, but it remains a very close contest.
Boeing 737-300 is that company's latest plane. It's a stretched version of the 737-200. With total projected sales for 84 of $10 billion for all its planes, Boeing senses success returning after the years of recession. BA-146 is British Aerospace's only medium-sized jet airliner. Its sales tours have raised real and growing interest, and its latest customers are the most prestigious of all. Two 146s will join the Queen's flight in the spring of 1986. Its safety, quietness, efficiency and flexibility all strongly recommended. Another British success is the unlikely EA-7 Optica, the only purpose-built observation aircraft in the world. Its bulbous nose provides unequalled all-round visibility. At a third of the price of a single turbine helicopter, it can be run for a quarter of the cost. The contrast between the Airbus and the Microlite illustrates the vast range of aircraft shown at this year's Farnborough, from great to small, costly to cheap, conventional to somewhat bizarre. Microlites have captured popular imagination, and fragile though they do appear, some bold owners now plan to fly them around the world, even if such a trip takes a full year. The familiar Hawk, the RAF's main trainer, is a reminder that whatever plane you fly, a high level of skill is required. And for those destined to pilot the combat aircraft of today and tomorrow, training is ever more vigorous and expensive. It's expense that has led the RAF to seek a new turboprop trainer. And this demand has created a new intense competition with three finalists. This is the all-British entry, the Firecracker. It's a two-seat trainer which can reproduce the flight characteristics of jet, swept and delta wing combat aircraft, but without the cost.
Novartis PC9 is another finalist in this competition. It's made in Switzerland, but has British aerospace involvement. Farnborough has its international debut, but its makers hope that it will soon be very well known to would-be RAF pilots. It was the third finalist, the Tucano, made by Embraer Brazil, that put on the most startling display, one that almost looked like a trainee pilot's nightmare. Perhaps the Red Arrows, hawks flown by the RAF's aerobatic team, exemplify more than any other display at Farnborough the ultimate skills desired by all those who take to the sky. For all its emphasis on technology and on business, Farnborough remains essentially a tribute to flying. Farnborough 1984, like all of its predecessors, is a triumph of man and machine together. Purposeful, graceful arrows through the air. <laughs>